Hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to episode 50 of HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners five days a week. Today, we're joined by Emily Loftin Casace. Emily is the HR Director for Europe and International HR Director at uh, Urban Outfitters. Emily, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. I'm really good. Good. Um, Emily, fill in the gaps. Tell our listeners a little bit about yourself personally um, and your journey to to where we are today. Okay. So my journey and me. So I've been at Urban for eight years. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. It's, yeah, some time. Um, We're a evolving and ever-changing business so I think that's why you would have people like me that have the longevity that I have um before I came here I'd experienced HR in a lot of different formats and was always really interested in it and I'd always worked within it and then coming here we my at the time my director and I were just two-person team and we set the every structure up from scratch We, we had nothing at that point Wow. Um, Urban were in a few countries in Europe, had about, I think about 18 stores. Ansbro had one on Regent Street, three people weren't here, and shared services were being built. So we created everything. We started really in the recruitment area um, and built that, and then we really quickly took on head office HR and, and created that. And then we took on stores HR and created that. Um, And I've been leading on my own here for about the last three years. Um, Yeah, and it's forever changed. And now we have five streams to the team. Um, We have recruitment and HR head office, recruitment and HR for um, stores. And then we have an HR team that also pick up recruitment um, in the DC. And we cover 11 countries um uh, roughly two and a half thousand people and then we're also involved in the international project that the business is running as well at the moment so going back a second why why hr what was it about hr that attracted you as a, as a career path mm, good question um we actually have my mum to thank for that <laughs> it all the way back right it's always the parents fault isn't it um, I remember graduating and she said to me, I think, you'd, I think you should do that. I think you'd be really good. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I definitely don't want to do that. And now we're here. So <laughs> mum's so always right. So you've got to thank right. her now, right? So, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, she's always right. Um, I am a true generalist and I really like the agility that you need to move across all of those areas. And plus, uh, in my particular role, I span four different business areas, three brands and shared services. So there, there's a lot of um, complexity for me to think about. And I think if I had a one dimensional role, which honestly HR never is, no. I don't think it would challenge me enough. So that's probably why HR. Yeah. So what very interesting that you built the function from scratch. Mm. And I'm sure looking back, there was definitely some things that stood out, some lessons learned, some mistakes oh, along uh, the way. Yeah. But for other HR leaders that are going to be in a similar position in the future where they have to build a function, looking back, what advice would you give? You, to- you know, it's not even looking back, it's now still. You have to continually evolve and you have to continually self-reflect. And the minute you stop doing that is the minute you become stagnant. So I think working within the business and partnering with the business is the biggest thing. And look, we've all seen that change over the last 10 to 15 years in HR. You know, we're, we're not red tape. We, we are there supporting the business hand in hand. Um, so evolution, self-reflection, and just being as close to the business as possible because there's just really no point in building a function up that doesn't help the business in the way they perceive they need the help. Mm. right so you know what's the what's the thing that's going to be noisiest for you yeah let's try and evolve that first it doesn't mean we're going to ignore the other areas but let's listen to what the business needs are as well how do you ensure that you don't get stagnant you know and that you are evolving and uh, because some people they don't know that like you could you you get caught in that cycle and you're not aware self-aware how do you say self-aware yeah sure that you are you know moving with the business and evolving 
Well, I think there's a number of ways to do that. I think one is to continually be looking into industry and what people are doing. And I don't mean the industry you work in, I mean industry generally. So um, a great example, a big focus for us, we're three days into the new financial year. Um, the talent strategies vision is engagement, right? Engagement's a huge topic, it's massive. And when I was thinking about engagement and insights that I would need, I was thinking about industry generally. I was thinking about, okay, well, Facebook are great engagement. So what do they do? Virgin are known for being great engagement. What do they do? You're already seeing they're not retailers, right? So you have to be, I think you have to be really fearless at looking outside to see who does what and how you can do it better. But you also have to, I think, have to be really resilient because ever evolving can be quite draining. But I work in an industry and with brands that nothing stays the same for them either. They're always moving. They always want to be brand leaders. They always want to be the best. They always want to be the fastest. So we have to try and catch up with that and be the HR team that is delivering the same thing for them in what, in our function and what we do. So um, I think there's a, just a very certain way of looking at everything and always trying to challenge the status quo. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's one of the reasons why we called our events HR Innovation right, right. <laughs> in the first place. I always found it crazy when I, when I did the big event that most people wanted to network with their peers in the same industry. Right. And whilst that may have worked in the past <laughs> for, you know, to help you, yeah. when you get to a certain point, you're never really going to gain a competitive advantage by looking inside your it's, own but it's area. Com- but it's comfortable. Yeah, because you know, oh, they're doing it, it works, so we can do right. it, basically. It's comfortable. So, yeah. And there's a moment in everyone's career where the comfort helps. And, you know, I, I would say that it's probably been the last, you know, two and a half years where I've had the moment of realisation of if I continue to stay in purely the industry that we're in, I don't know if we're ever going to be the best because I'm always chasing what someone else is doing. So if I can just purely look at the focus that we have, look at who's winning the accolades, look at where the talent is, and then get the insight from there to find out, okay, well, what are they doing that's so great? We can't take the whole thing because we're a different industry, but we can take some of that and we can bend that and we can, you know, nuance it to our brand and our you know the country that we're in and all that good stuff but um i think it's really important to try and look industry wide i think um more and more now i, I i'm getting people saying you know, i don't want to meet anyone in my industry it's completely gone the other right. way around and they're saying because right. they as you said they want to look at you know the facebook's out there or the googles or yeah. whatever whatever these organizations are doing one thing that i found more and more recently is a lot of the big global brands that i'm speaking with they want to network with startups yeah, of course. Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. right? And this, and then the startups are, are the same opposite way around. Saying, I want to network with the, the guys at the top. It's quite yeah. funny. <laughs> Whereas, you know, obviously, as a startup, they're, they're agile, they can innovate quickly, you know, and there's so many advantages. Right, from, and from a people side for a startup, you know, how many times have you heard that? We have unlimited holiday. We don't have job titles. We don't have a desk. You hot desk. All those things you can do when you have 20 people that makes them productive and engaged being my key thing is great that you transform that to a five billion dollar business and you can't do the same thing so yeah. where, where do you where do you where's where does it become affected along the way and how do you keep it and then when you gain insights from people like facebook and google you know i'm not unfortunately in the position where we can have a running track running through the 10 floors of our incredible <laughs> office at King's Cross, right? I can't, a slide yeah I can't slide that, but, let's take the slide downstairs right, <laughs> But, but there are things you can take that they do that are recognition tools or engagement tools that work really well um, and relate them back into your business. Yeah. Do you do yeah. flexible working where you guys are? Yeah, you know, we actually took a big step forward in it last year um, and there are pockets of the business that are very flexible um, and we just need to use this financially to continue to talk about that. Um, we're not 100% where we need to be but we I was I'm really happy with the step forward we took last year and um we are a global business so anything like that we would also need to make sure we're socializing that idea within North America as well mm. um so hopefully we'll get there in time and you know back to your point earlier of the startups like that's what that's why that's why they're so great yeah right they can just have full full, full flex no one has to even put a flexible working anymore it's full flex you know because it's, pr- it's proven through research that people are much more productive when they feel empowered and they are more engaged 
because it's more flexible for them and that's very important in the new generations yeah i know it's 100 percent. even people that i've interviewed for our for our business so we're a small team the expectations now are completely yeah. different when yeah. i started at 17 you know you did whatever you were told and you yeah. like you know you bend it to the will of the business so now it's yeah. the way around that the, the employees have the power and they the business is how and now having to bend to the will yes. of the employees it's such yes. a big shift yeah such it's a, a big big shift and there's there's this misconception that the new generations aren't loyal yeah um, and that's not true they are loyal they're very loyal but the expectations are different so the the main difference for us as the as the business is they won't sit and take it if you're not if you're not delivering for them they the way they need it to be delivered they won't be engaged and they will leave that doesn't make them not loyal it just means they have a higher expectation yeah. Whereas I was the same when I started in retail, it was split shifts, double shifts, whatever we needed to do. A visit's coming in, we'll pull a night shift at the last minute. And that doesn't happen now. Yeah, so, in my first job, I didn't even get a computer. My first job, I got sat at a desk with no computer for right. about a month, at least a month. Uh, yeah, that would be just one that would never happen. So I had to share a computer between right. one computer between five people and, right. five, and we used to send our emails at the end of the day on this one computer and uh yeah it was just like all of the perks you have now or, or you know even if you didn't have even if you if you go into an office now it doesn't have wi-fi it's like oh my god <laughs> we don't have wi-fi what's going on but there's nothing wrong with it though yeah. Yeah. right there's nothing, no, I completely wrong, agree. there's nothing wrong with a changing expectation and a changing culture what's wrong is if we as industry can't get there quick enough to keep up with it because you're never gonna engage and retain your or even attract the emerging talent if you're not doing you know recognizing it and trying to move with it mm -hmm. you mentioned engagement is a big big a big area for you big, what, are yeah. some, what are some of the things you're doing in, in the business then to to engage the wider so yeah so last year we had a first year so we, we trialed before as i'm sure lots of businesses have social committees Mm -hmm. And it would never really get off the ground properly because it would be people within the teams and they would never have budget for anything. And so we took the decision off the back of the engagement survey last year that we would put in place an executive social and benefits committee and we would run benefits focus groups and we would talk to them about the stuff that, because benefits came up massively in the engagement survey last year. So or the year before now and talked massively about with them but okay well you said this and this is what you really want so that was last year was a huge focus for that so we moved a lot of dials for them around benefits and flexible working and recognizing where we were behind to drive engagement um engagement this year so the survey that we that we did at the back end of last year Benefits didn't come up at all, which is awesome because it means we've had a year where we've put the right stuff in place and they're hearing that and they're seeing it. Um, but engagement keeps me up at night because of exactly what we talked about, the shift in generation, the change of expectation, and we're not getting there quick enough. And we're doing great, but we can always do better. And that's that whole you know, self-reflection piece that I'm afflicted with, unfortunately. Um, so... The things that we're trying to focus on into this year is to try, from my side anyway, is to try and build the understanding of the complexity of engagement. Because I think there's a, a, there's a view that is, oh, it's a drinks trolley on a Friday, and that engages people. And in fact, engagement is very deep, has lots of layers, and is very complex, and actually runs into every single area of your business. And for, for HR, hits every single generalist area, and it impacts it. So the things that we have on for this year and what we try to do is not have loads of focuses because we're small teams and, and, you know, an engagement survey with a hundred things to action off the back of it. So um, one is comms. We're going to work harder on how we're communicating, what we're communicating, when we're communicating, because I think there's, um, there's a, a need in the um, emerging talent to understand more about the business. And from our side in HR, you know, we had our biggest HR reporting year last year that any of us have ever seen. Um, and we should not be naive to think that the younger generations aren't reading your modern slavery statement and aren't reading your gender pay gap statement. They are. They're interested in that and they're interested in, in what you're saying and how you're saying it and what it means for them. So communication is probably the biggest one that we're going to try and work on. 
um, and when there's some stuff around the office environment that's really impacting engagement that we're trying to also work on. That's very niche to our business particularly. I think what we can talk about is a transformation of when I took the lead oh. in the department and how we changed the face of it because that's perfect. That yeah. that was a that was a transformation. So we I, I always knew in the number two seat that where I wanted to focus on what I wanted to do. Um, and when you know it's it can be a bit scary when you when in a business where you've already got legacy and history and your you know your previous leader left and you stepped in you've got you've got to try and untie yourself from what it was before and, and set yourself as the leader when you're already seen as a number two for, by everybody right so there's a journey there that has to be had where suddenly you're in the leadership meeting now so what does that mean and and what are you how are you adding value that wasn't added before so i think that transformation it was really clear to me that we needed to focus a lot more on hr and not lose the focus on recruitment but not only talk about that because you know what there's a lot of other stuff we should be talking about not just how many roles we filled and what's difficult and what's on and you know we should also be making the leaderships and talk about well how did your lto look and how was your call to the exit interview? How did that look? When, when did we last do succession planning? And when did you last focus there? So um, that transformation, I'm very, very lucky because I, I in, in the two biggest brands here, I have two incredible female MDs um, who are absolute inspirations and are have, have a lot of time for people and the initiatives that talent are trying to talk about also have a lot of experience and knowledge to share um, and I'm very very lucky with them and they were both incredibly supportive as we went on the journey of okay and it, and it wasn't a outward from today we're changing the face of the talent department it was a it was a general move and starting to say okay we're going to show you a bit more reporting and we're going we're going to play back a little bit more about where we're at but also you know we're going to set the agenda on engagement we're going to set the agenda on what what is what is what is the engagement survey telling us? What are your people telling us? We're going to talk about compliance. We're going to talk about how long it takes to set up a new country when we're opening a new store, and what does that mean? And how and if we're we've had a lot of transformation of countries where we've gone from six people to sixty, and the understanding of, from the front is oh well, you already set up there, you know what you're doing. The six to sixty is very very different. Do you get quite a lot of problems at sixty? And what does that mean? Um, and, you know, as I, as I referred to earlier, having the biggest year on HR reporting, um, talking to them about that, bringing them into that conversation, explaining to them what that is and why we have to do it and what does it feel like and what does it look like. And that transformation was, um, at times, challenging emotionally, time-consuming. Um, you know, you have self-doubt sometimes, you're doing the right thing. And this is, it's big, right? You're, you're trying to change everything that you're known for and you're doing, and you're trying to put your own foot out in front and how does that work? And you have moments of doubt. Um, but we're fortunate with, with the support of those um, incredible leaders and plus their teams around them, that we've very much been able to do that. And we've been able to become the full HR division that we needed to and we've been able to get the support and the understanding and the listening on how can we better improve things for our people and we you know just KPI metric wise I don't love all of them but for a second we've been able to drive them over turnover over the years we've been able to you know maintain time to fill on recruitment as we've got bigger you know we've been able to increase the amount of people that are talking to us in the engagement survey you know people that want to get involved in focus groups the support that we can give through business partnering we've been able to increase all that so yeah it's been a, it's been a big transformation i think you hit on two really interesting points there one was no one really talks about the you're the first person to bring up the fact of taking over going from a number two to a number one in the business that's such an interesting topic you, as soon as you mentioned that, i was like wow that's so many people yeah, must be going through that similar transformation yeah. i can't believe it's nothing that's ever been discussed yeah before. well I, I, actually that i Actually, I think sometimes people can't because you're, you feel in some sides of you that you're tarred with the legacy. Yeah. And How did you create your own lane then? How did you sort of create, you know, this is my lane? Because yeah, <laughs> you know, you've been in someone yeah. else's lane for so long, yeah, right? I, I, think, 
I think what, what I think we started with low hanging fruit. I hate the phrase, but it's easy to understand, right? What are the things we can really quickly do that are going to add value that we don't do that we've never seen that we can start to set our stall out by? And for me, it was reporting. So it was let me let me play it back to you. Let me show you every month what we're, how we're looking, and let's make everyone accountable for it. Let's talk about it. And and they were just I, again, I'm so lucky with the people I work with. They're all so um, incredible, but we're very lucky that. They were interested in it and they wanted to talk about it and they wanted to give feedback on i'd love to see more of this or can we see some of that um but you know it would be un an untruth if you if you didn't admit that it's also a very emotionally challenging time because you are stepping into the number one spot you know how you want to be and there are times when you feel like you're still viewed as a number two you're still viewed as the junior person in the room and you're not anymore so but you also don't want to be you know, the archaic way of doing it is, you know, come in, you know, all guns blazing. You don't want to do that either. You want to prove, show and prove through great work that that's why you took that spot and that's why you're there. And some of it, honestly, is self-doubt. It's not even other people yeah. thinking it, saying it. It's you thinking it. And if you're self-reflective, you're also very hard on yourself. So you come out of things and go, oh, gosh, I should have chosen a different word. I should have used a different format on that. Or I think that uh, the best, the funniest example is I was taking... The, the EU leadership team through a compliance deck that I take the North America guys through every quarter and had a typo in there, which is probably the funniest typo I've ever come across. I'm sure they have. And it set the whole room alight with laughter. And I just I couldn't handle it. Oh, like, you've got to share it now. You've got to share it. You can't, you can't. Well, it. So my, <laughs> our founder is a guy called um, Dick Hayes. Mm -hmm. um, and we were talking about non-slavery and how a board member needs to sign the statement sure so that has to go to america for it to be signed yeah right? makes sense Again, i'm very lucky i've I, absolutely incredible partners in north america i'm very very lucky everything's made so easy for us to partner um and i had put on the deck when we were talking about in north america a board member and i thought well, for those guys i'll just put dick signs it because it'll be easier but i didn't take out a so it said a dick signs it <laughs> the whole, the whole room. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, amazing. Great, right? The whole room. How how long was you into the role then? <laughs> it probably was. I think it was maybe a year ago. I was I was into it long enough. Oh, okay. But emotionally, I probably I I wasn't quite ready to be strong enough with that because you know it was a mistake. <laughs> that's great. That's, hard, that's right. So they're all you know laughing, and I'm trying to be very serious. And go, we're talking about something very serious. Can we you know can we move on? <laughs> One of the execs in the room is in the same office as me, and uh, he, saw me, he saw me the next day. He's like, he's, he spotted it, and he's like, you know, I'm, um, oh, don't don't take that to heart. I'm really sorry about that. I shouldn't have, you know, spot, you know, I shouldn't have, have mentioned it. He said, you know, it's funny. It was funny. Don't worry about it. And I thought, yeah, it's perfect. Well, it's yeah, great. I mean, it's just great when you're trying to, you know, <laughs> trying, to, trying to trying to set the tone, trying to right. you know, build credibility, yeah. trying to <laughs> you're trying to be that credible HRD, you know. <laughs> You make that type of typo. It's just wonderful. But this is real life. This is what I love about the doing the podcast is sharing these type of moments. But also, real the, life. And you mentioned earlier about the stress that comes with it. And other people don't, a lot of people don't talk about, you know, the sleepless nights. Yeah. With that, you know, the long hours. No one talks about that stuff. You know, yeah, everyone wants I mean, to talk about the great things that go along with it. It's a given. I mean, I don't know if it's the same in every business, but, you know, for me, it's a given. It always has been. And I also, my, my boss is in North America and, um, you know, I cover a huge amount with a very lean team. So that's going to require a lot of work. And we're no different from the rest of the business. They all cover a lot with lean teams. So there's a lot of moments where, you know, the only time you can speak to that person is at seven o'clock. Yeah. And I, because, you know, well, both of us have been back to back all day long and we'll put the children to bed and then we'll have a chat to, you know, because tomorrow is the same as back to back all day long. Um, it's crazy. What advice would you give to, because I think the whole number two, it's, it's, it's different when you come into a new business as number one, oh, yeah. because you don't have the expectations, uh, yeah. or you do have expectations, but it's not like, you know, people already knew who you were, right? You're already known in the business, people know who you are, now you're stepping into that number one seat. Yeah. You know, what advice do you wish, you wish you had back then, looking back to you have now, that you can yeah. sort of reflect on now? Um, I actually had great advice at the time, because I moved... Um, and reported into the person my boss was reporting into who at the time was our CLO. So I feel very fortunate. Um, to what was that advice? Um, There's a couple of things. I think one was be honest about what you did because there are moments when you're number two when you've done a bunch of stuff, but it's come across as if it wasn't yours. So don't 
No, not in a. No, hundred percent. I could. Everyone can. Re- everyone can relate to what you just said. Right. Don't. Everyone. Don't. Don't. Find, you, know, you don't. You don't need to like. You know, print a list out and give it to everyone. No. 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 But I know but, what you mean. I know what you mean. You know, I think it's more of a thing of don't hide your light under a bushel. Um, but also that challenge of being, you know, stepping into the seat, already being known as, you know, a very credible head of function. Um, so don't, just don't be scared to have the voice heard. But I mean, the best advice I've ever had is you don't always have to speak. And I speak a lot, so that's <laughs> a good lesson, right? You, you don't always, it's, it, you don't have to be the loudest voice in the room always. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was fortunate. I just had a lot of support, whether it was actual advice, there was just a lot of support to change the dynamic. And when you're trying new things to get the, every time the unequivocal, yes, we'll try that. Yes, let's do that. That's a good idea. Or sometimes the challenge of well, what what do you think, what benefit is that going to give us? You know, knowing you need the rationale to be behind. Um, but yeah, it is, it can be challenging. And I empathize with anyone that just can't do it because the legacy is too much to try and break. Um, and I didn't, I did think to myself coming into this year, we're as of three days into our financial year, you know the person I took over from I really don't want that name to try and come up this year it's the third year right so let's let's really try for that not to happen not in a horrible or bad way but we, we've done enough now to not have to say well this person did that and that person did that you know we've done enough now to try and move forward from it and and to create in our on our in our own way um I was also fortunate to have a very very great then my team are incredible so they were also very supportive along the journey um but, you know, he, he would have always said to me, don't, don't be too hard on yourself, right? Like, you're not, not everything's going to be right straight away. You have to give yourself time. But remember that you, you're not in the seat for no reason. So you have to you remember why you're there, right? So um, I'm also really fortunate to have a coach. And I think we've talked a lot about, um, as I touched on earlier, some of it's in your head. Some of it, it, some of it isn't based on... <laughs> what no one said it to you no one's so some of it's just something that you're thinking that isn't actually true at all um and controlling the emotions and something i actually shared with my team recently with this amazing picture that i saw and that i researched about which is um a professor did this at a uni of holding up a glass of water and asking his students how heavy is the water so they all i might do it they all throw out you know different weights whatever it's like, a, how long can we hold it for? And I don't know, like an hour, work, day, whatever. And he, and he breaks it down and says, to them, okay, so if you hold it for an hour, your arm's a bit numb, but you're okay. If you hold it for a day, it's debilitating. And on that basis, if you hold on to a mistake, if you hold on to any emotion that you're, you're working from a work perspective that you're holding, you can't get anything else done. So I try and live by that. So that typo, that hilarious typo, I had to force myself to go, don't think about that again. Okay, it was done, you've moved on, it's finished. They've not thought about it again. So move on, it's okay, move on from it. And you make a mistake, we're human, you make mistakes, just move on from it. You can't, you know, let it eat you up. But I did share that with the team just in our recent away day to set up the year, because I really, I really, you know, HR can be a lonely world because you can't speak to anyone else in your business because you're their person. You are the person that they speak to. Right, so, yeah. um, and you, do make mistakes because we're human so let's just not hold on to stuff let's celebrate the great stuff more and let's move on from the mistake and just make it won't happen next time because you made the mistake it's fine yeah one of the things that i always I used to say or i think what my ceo my last company said to me she said chris you always think to yourself is what i'm doing and thinking right now getting me closer to my goals right and if it's not then stop doing it and stop thinking about it yeah. And it's easier said than done, but now I always think that. Like, you know, whenever I come across a situation like what, like what you just said, I always think, yeah. you know, is this getting me closer to where I want to go? Is what I'm thinking right now getting me closer? Yeah. And 99 point, all actually every time, it's just no. So then stop doing it and get on right. with so you, what you, you need just, to do. You just have to like train yourself to take the lesson and move on. Yeah. There's always a lesson in something, right? So just take the lesson, internalize the lesson, let it go. But it's great when you become self aware of it the way you are now. Yeah. And, the, and the way I am, as soon as you become self-aware of it and you can look outside of the box at yourself and go, okay, that's holding me back. Right. That change, that's a game changer. Right. Massive. But massive. For, for, for many people. Well, look, that leads us quite nicely onto 
the quick fire round mm. <laughs> where <laughs> I'm going to ask you five questions okay. and you have no longer than 30 seconds to give us some amazing answers. Are you ready? Amazing answers. What was the number one thing that was holding you back from becoming a senior HR leader? Um, I think what we talked about, um, not holding on to stuff and feelings, emotions, um, and believing in yourself enough. Fantastic. Um, what's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Um, you can only do so much in a day. Great. What's one book that you'd recommend to our listeners and why? Uh, Pitch Perfect, which is I'm studying it now, actually, with my director. Not the movie, uh, right? No. <laughs> uh, I'm studying it now. Forgive, forgive me if uh, the title's slightly wrong, but I think that's right. And it's actually perfect for HR because it is about saying it right the first time every time. The tone, the intonation, the words, and we always have to evolve that as HR professionals. So Great. Uh, could you share one internet resource that you use to keep up to date with current events or to... to uh, uh, ne- network probably, and learn uh business that's probably harvard business review mm-hmm. fantastic and uh what's one thing about your business mm. that most excites you today um how entrepreneurial we are um how inspiring we are um and how emerging fantastic well look, you've been an amazing guest Thank, Thank you very you. much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Um, give our listeners, if there's one piece of parting guidance that you could give to your peers out there, what would that be? Forever evolve. Continuous. In, in yourself, but also in what you're delivering. Always look at it again. Always challenge the status quo. Not saying, is it good enough? But is it, right, like, is it modern enough? Is it agile enough? Um, is it going to inspire the latest generation that we have? Fantastic. Well, look, thank you again for taking the time to join us. Um, guys, make sure you head over to hrddealers.com. There you'll find all of the show notes on the episode, everything we've been talking about. Uh, Emily, thank you for sharing your journey with us. No and uh, I wish you all the best until we next speak. Thank you.